Good morning and a welcome to a year active debate supported by Natural Mineral Waters Europe. This morning we'll be discussing the circularity of bottles contributing to the EU Green Deal. A big thank you to everyone who has joined us early this morning online and a reminder that if you do have a question or comment, don't forget to send it into our chat page along with the name of the panellist it's directed at and we're going to pick out your questions for later on in the programme. So get involved please. Now all of us are surely aware of the danger of plastic and specifically what single-use plastic poses to our environment and our health. Millions of tonnes of plastic leaks into our oceans every year and some experts suggest that by 2050 the ocean will have more plastic by weight than fish. And if you think, well that doesn't really bother me, well so much of what you eat, clothes, they're full of thousands of microplastics. Now in 2019 the EU single-use plastics directive came into effect and in helping to promote the transition to a circular economy specific targets included a 90% collection target for PET bottles and mandated that all PET beverage bottles must be made with 25% of recycled plastic from 2025 and 30% from 2030. Now PET is a material with the best potential to be reused in a closed loop but food grade recycled PET is in high demand. An increasing number of non food industries are using recycled PET for their own products. Now those in the beverage industry argue items made by non-food industries, so toys, clothing, etc., create downcycling as they are rarely recycled back into the same product after use and so end up in things such as landfill or incinerators. The beverage industry now see the revision of the single-use plastic directive as a chance to improve circularity by, well, in essence, giving them first dibs on recycled PET. Does that sound about right? Well, let's now ask the experts. Let me introduce you to our panellists. We have Ma Maya Degree de Lou, uh, Policy Officer, Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive at the DG um, at the European um, Commission, Envy. We also have MEP Martin Hosick, who's a member of Envy Committee at the European Parliament. We also have Larissa Coppello, uh, Consumption and Production Campaigner at Zero Waste Europe. And we also have Roel Anega, Chairman and CEO of, of Gero Steiner. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, well, now to understand who all the panelists are, I'm going to open the debate, first of all, by asking them to, well, introduce themselves to all of you. So let me start first with Maha Degree Dulu, if you'd like to go first, please. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Marianne, for this introduction. Um, indeed, so I'm a policy officer in DG Environment uh, in, uh, in the European Commission, and I'm dealing with the revision of the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive. Now, many of you uh, know me because I've been working on this subject already for many years. Uh, now it's the third year, um, and we have. Uh, I'm happy to announce that we have now reached a, a certain milestone in uh, our work, uh, so we have submitted our policy um, impact assessment report, so uh, the, the policy proposal, uh, to the so-called inter-service uh, regulatory scrutiny board. So this is a very important step in our uh, inter internal process for adopting uh, the, the legislation. And um, so indeed, uh, the revision of the packaging and packaging waste directive is likely to take a greater, a bigger, let's say, um, um, a profile than initially expected, as we are also turning this uh, directive into a regulation. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, over now to our MEP, Martin Hosek, if you'd like to take the floor, please. Uh, first of all, good morning and, and really glad to be here. Uh, well, I'm uh, a member of European Parliament uh, from Slovakia, talking to you actually right now from, from Bratislava, from the capital, uh, and uh, coming from a country which just this January actually started to finally, after almost 20 years of efforts by the civil society push it through, uh, it's a uh, bottle deposit scheme for the uh, PET bottles uh, from the beverage industry. So there is a big step forward and something which is, I think, very topical for this discussion. In the European Parliament, I sit in the Envy Committee, but also uh, substituting in the budget and ITRE, which I think is a handy combination of money, uh, industry and environment. Uh, but also I'm the contact person, the liaison for the European Chemicals Agency and been dealing with toxic chemicals for last, well, I think more than 20 years. Uh, and I think this is also very connected because what we see uh, in relation also uh, with the plastic issues overall and the circularity is the discussion about the presence of hazardous chemicals, 
uh, in uh, the different types of plastics and uh, how we can make sure that the circular economy is, is toxic free one, but also fits within the planetary boundaries, for example, uh, and especially now uh, on the side of the climate, because honestly, uh, we also have to make sure that the circular economy is climate neutral. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, over to our next panelist, uh, Larissa Capello. If you'd like to go uh, take the floor, please. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation for this panel. So my name is Larissa. I'm a campaigner at uh, Zero Waste Europe, working a lot of, on packaging, plastic, and also reuse. Um, so when it comes to circularity of bottles, which is the subject of this panel, uh, most people would think directly on ensuring high quality recycling, uh, bottle to bottle and recycled content, which is definitely part of the measures um, to ensure circularity of bottles. Uh, but in order to drive uh, real circularity, I think we, know we first think, need to think about prevention and reuse in line uh, of the waste hierarchy. And there's a lot of potential of, uh, of be beverage bottles in general, not only PT, uh, for reuse and refill as well. Um, so that's uh, why I'd like to contribute here in this discussion. Thank you. Okay, lovely. And then to our final panelist, then, Roland Egger, you'd like to take the floor for a few minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, Mariam, and, and good morning to everybody. So my name is Roland Hahn, and um, I'm not only the CEO of Gerolsteiner Brunnen and the Volcanic Eiffel in Germany, I'm, I'm also a member of the board of Natural Mineral Waters Europe. <clears throat> um, sustainability is and has always been an integral part of the DNA of the mineral water industry at large. Um, our business model is based on acting in harmony with the natural resources that have been put at our responsibility. So therefore, for us, it is only logical that the mineral water industry is committed to actively contribute to the success of the European Green Deal. Mineral water is a unique product. It's naturally pure. There is no processing other than some filtering. It has clear health benefits. It's got valuable minerals and it contains no baddies whatsoever. So we are providing healthy hydration whilst taking care of unique natural resources for the long term. Packaging circularity is key to our ambition of bringing our industry to the next level of sustainable development. Circularity is technically possible for us today. Our products are already fully recyclable. However, we need two enablers in place, an efficient collection system for used bottles through a deposit return system and priority access to the recycled PET deriving from beverages. Currently, only 60% of PET bottles across the EU are collected. And of this, only a small amount of recycled PET is available to be used for the same applications, i.e. bottles. If we can improve collection and create bottle to bottle recycling, little stands in the way of becoming truly circular. So to sum it up, we are ready for the circularity journey and uh, we call on our value chain partners as well as the European Commission to help us to realize it. Okay, thank you all of, um, to all of the panelists. Okay, well, let me open up the debate then. And let me ask you about PET bottles specifically. How do you see them you know, the use of PET bottles specifically transforming perhaps over the next few years or decade? And will it really be able to accelerate the transition to a circular economy, especially if we see such a high demand across all industries increasing? And I'll work backwards. I'll start with Mr. Um, Aneg first. First of all, I think PET, if, if you look at it from a technical point of view, just for, for beverages or for food, it's, it's a great product, right? It's very safe. Um, it's uh, it's transparent for bottles and it's uh, and it's fully recyclable. So in that sense, um, it's a great material. But obviously, we need to make sure uh, that we can actually make new bottles out of existing bottles, and that currently is a challenge. Um, and definitely, there is uh, there is a, you need to look. I think at all packaging. So when I look at my company, Gerald Steiner, we have refillable glass, we have refillable PET and uh, we have non-refillable PET. And I think they all play a role. And I think, by the way, they can all be very competitive at very good levels uh, in terms of the ecological footprint uh, that they create, even if we want to improve on all of them. And on non-refillable PET, obviously, the key really is that at the moment, there is a lot of downcycling taking place we, because in most cases, we do not have access to the material after it's being used, either 
because it's not collected or um, if it's collected, it's being sold to the textile industry, car industry, uh, which is the end of, of circularity. Okay, lovely. Uh, Larissa Capella, then, if you'd like to uh, maybe give your inputs about, especially what, what uh, perhaps what Ms. Onega was talking about there, about recycling PAT proving t or potentially being a challenge. Um, yes, in fact, uh, we have released a recent study uh, about the circularity of PET, and it shows that the recycling rate around 50% only, and that recycle content of PET around 17%, because may, the remaining recycled PET is downcycled in other lower grade manufacturer application. Um, and this is, it is considered like uh, breaking the loop uh, because the, the material should go back to uh, recycle bottle to bottle and not go other applications such as textiles or uh, automotive sector, etc. Um, so there is a really great potential there um, in the revision of the packaging packaging waste directive uh, to ensure that producers have access priority access to this uh, materials that they, they, they place in the markets and then they can fully recycle um, high high quality recycle and bottle to bottle their um, their materials and products. Martin Isaac, your thoughts? Well. First of all, I think what we uh, have to realize is that uh, we ultimately need to make sure that the PET uses, so to say, 100% from recycled sources. We have very limited input of a fresh uh, raw material into this, and especially phase out ultimately the fossil materials. So look at the ways to make bio-based plastic that we can then retire back to the uh, environment, because in that way we really only can ensure the sustainable carbon cycle in terms of the materials. And I'm saying this to start because it's kind of, for me, sets the bigger picture where we had to, where we need to head. Now, in a, in a shorter term, I think the, the first very re simple recipe, and that's also my criticism towards uh, the beverage industry, it is that uh, the best way to get the PET material back is to refill the bottles. Uh, at the moment, also the deposit schemes that we have are primarily about getting back the PET and basically recycling. But on the uh, waste hierarchy, what we see higher up, what is more environmentally sound, is is the refill. And it's interesting to see that you know what we saw in the, uh, what we and still see in lots of the use of the glass bottles. Energy was also much more better to refill them. I think the first step we need to look is look at ways how we can go way more for the refill because this is the most environmentally sound approach. Okay, thank you, MEP uh, Hosek. Um, I will allow some you know, response from the industry there uh, to our representative of the industry. But first of all, let's, let's go to Maya Degree Delu um, for your sort of opening thoughts on PET. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, first of all, what I would like to say is that we have... Um, in the preparation of the revision of the, our directive, had many meetings with the industry and we have heard these calls and we have listened to them as well. So that is why we have included also in our considerations measures um, that uh, would help industry to, to recover back uh, the, the material, uh, in particular clear uh, PET that is coming from the deposit and return systems. Um, and we have now assessed also in our draft report um, several measures which would help industry in this regard. Uh, now, I will not enter and give details whether uh, which ones of these measures are now in the preferred policy option and which one will be taken forward because this is still really uh, internal discussions and I would like to, to keep them internal for the time being. But uh, I, I can just assure you that uh, these considerations have been made, uh, in particular as regards the measure, for example, for setting a mandatory uh, deposit and return system for plastic bottles, uh, which has been considered um, as well as um, with the objective uh, to, to, to reach the 90% uh, separate collection target, which would then, of course, allow um, 
much cleaner um, um, uh, recyclates uh, and uh, closed loop recycling. Um, we have also considered uh, the measure suggested uh, by industry, <laughs> which I hear also clearly mentioned, um, although not clearly spoken out, the access to the priority access to the recyclate that is coming from the DRS systems. Um, and we have also considered minimum requirements uh, for these uh, DRS systems that member states will have to set up. So these measures have been assessed and are now part of our um, uh, further work. Okay, over to Mr. Anega first. And is there a problem then between policy or legislation versus real time use? You heard there from um, from from um, the MEP who was, in some essence, crit uh, critiquing your industry, saying that you're not really recycling enough PET. Well, I think there's two things. I mean, no, we're not recycling enough when it comes to non-refillable. Uh, but there is there is a reason for that. Uh, even you're like prohibiting us uh, doing that because you need to have the material, right? Um, and and that is not so easy. So, and I think there is there is a clear movement. I you see a lot of um, producers these days who are making very strong commitments uh, to the amount of um, refillable PET that we want to use and. And NMWE has done that as well. So Natural Mineral Waters Europe, and our targets are actually ahead of the SUPD. Um, and there might even be more scope uh, on that. But when it comes to non-refillable, again, it's very important that we have access to the material, right? It's what we use is a very high quality material. It's food grade PET. And you simply need to have access. As again, the, technically today, the products can be fully circular. Um, I agree with Martin, there is always in the processing, there is a small part which will get lost. I think if those amounts get small enough, we might be able to, to close that in the future with bio-based materials or maybe other technologies. So I, I, I definitely think there's scope there. The one thing I however, would say, uh, because also a few comments have been made uh, on um, non-refillable versus refillable. And um, if I speak from my position in Germany, we, we have uh, a long-standing DRS system. We have a business, again, we have one third glass refillable, one third PET refillable, one third non-refillable. And it is our clear conviction that um, all three can be very competitive and we can get to very good values in terms of the sustainability footprint. But we are very much against discrimination at this stage of, of any packaging. I think that is not helpful. We need to improve on all, and we believe that non-refillable um, has a lot of uh, potential in doing this. Um, but again, for that, we need deposit return system, which also, by the way, solves the issue of littering. Right? Those countries that have the RS systems in place today in the European Union all have collection well ahead of 90% um, of their bottles. And they're all being reused in some way, shape, or form. Some of them are being washed here next door and being refilled. Some come back, you know, like basically as as flakes and um, and 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 new old bottles, and are being used again. Larissa Capello, you wanted to um, jump in here as well. I hear. Yes, sure. Um, so I'm really happy to kind of raise the bar of discussion on, on refuel and reuse. Uh, this is a topic that is very uh, relevant to us. I mean, this is for us the, really the real meaning of circularity and uh, in, in, indeed for all uh, beverage application. But uh, people, people when, when it calls PT first think about recycling and that's what I, I first said in this panel. Um, but actually, there's a lot of potential PET for refillable as well. Um, so the, the biggest market of PET bottles actually is for water, still water and soda drinks. Um, and there's already like 10 EU countries already have refillable market share um, of 10% for soda drinks and still water category. And we, if we look at uh, the example of Germany, for instance, that has the biggest refillable market in, in Europe, over 3 billion refillable PET are sold yearly in water category and 2 billion PET in soft drinks category. These, of course, can be improved, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> and I'm sure it can be. Um, and even given going even higher on the waste hierarchy, uh, on the mindset of prevention, if you think that most of PET is for still water, 
there's a lot of disposable packaging that could be prevented by just ensuring wide access to drinking water in as many places but as in as many places as possible uh, such as providing free tap water to consumers or implementing water fountains in cities which is already being done across europe Thank you. Okay, so Larissa, then a follow-up question. Um, you say you know water is the biggest market for PET, um, and you're the and you're also saying now that you're the objective voice um, in this discussion. So, is the non-beverage industry then contributing to downcycling? Are they the problem? Um, when you talk about recycling, um, as we said, um, there's a lot of uh, issue that we have uh, identified in our last. Uh, a study that most of the materials of PET, uh, which is actually a high food grade uh, material and highly recyclable, in fact, um, is going to low grade applications, unfortunately. And a lot of textiles, there was a, a recent report as well by Changing Markets, I think about the um, textiles and how much of plastics and PET is in the textiles. And when it goes, when it's downcycled and it goes to these materials, then it cannot be recycled back and go back to the loop again. So, in fact, talking about recyclability um, of PET, it should go back to the producers to ensure bottle to bottle recycle. That's the highest, uh, the effective way and, and highest uh, circularity uh, of PET in terms of recyclability, I'm saying. Okay, lovely. Um, I'm going to quickly go to a question from one of our audience members. Um, if I just find it back. Um, oh, the question seems to disappear suddenly. Um, but, oh, beyond, so 2D Burner, if I've got the name right, says beyond the question of recycling and reuse, which is crucial, there's also the question of the feedstock used for plastic production. What does the Commission and other panelists think about including CO2-based plastics? Um, made from carbon capture and utilization in the proposal. Um, and perhaps uh, Maya Degree Delu, you could answer that one. No, I don't, I don't think I can answer that one. No, we are not uh, going to impose the use of any particular material for the creation or, or, or for, the, for the production of PET bottles, if that was the question, no. Um, we are dealing uh, more with, uh, with issues that are related to the end-of-life uh, treatment of packaging. So we are not going to accept for where there are specific reasons, for example, the compostability, which is creating a lot of problems, again, at the end-of-life treatment, uh, because some confu there's confusion uh, in, um, uh, with consumers how to dispose of such waste, and there are also currently still very different also um, uh, in, in very different infrastructure in the member states. So these are the issues that we are dealing with. And here we are also intervening really in the, in the, in the, in the let's say, in the materials that have to be mandating in the kind of materials that have to be put into, into, the, into the products plus the, uh, packaging. Uh, also, of course, uh, as regards recycled content, but here this, it's a different issue. This is again the issue of, which is linked to the end of life and I mean, everything is linked also anyway the, the whole value chain is very much connected when you start dealing with one product you you, you soon realize that all problems um, are interconnected so um, indeed so the recycled content uh, is something that we will mandate um, not only for plastic bottles but also for larger groups of plastic packaging okay lovely. and then let me just follow up with you then um, the single use plastic directive is under review so what essentially are you reviewing Directive is not under review. The single use plastic directive is something that was adopted in 2019 and is being implemented. What is under review is the packaging and packaging waste directive. Uh, indeed, the plastic bottles are covered by both uh, legal instruments because they are packaging, but they are also single use product. Um, what we are going to propose is mandatory DRS mandatory deposit and return system uh, also including for plastic bottles so in this way we are going to help um, those member states which have currently still not considered putting in place DRS um, to meet the separate uh, collection target for plastic bottles which is set in the single-use plastic directive 
but um, yes. Okay, and then over to Martin Isaac then. Um, would, is it right to consider um, a proposition or, or, or a desire from the beverage industry um, the right of first refusal a mechanism? Uh, I see where they're coming from. Uh, I don't have a straightforward answer. It's something that we need to indeed, indeed consider. But then at the same time, the question is, well, if we are market economy, shouldn't it be about kind of uh, a price signals? Shouldn't it be about, uh, you know, who pays more uh, gets it? So the question is, and, I, and I'm provoking with this a bit because at this, I often hear from industry uh, don't regulate us, you know, free market, let the free market do the job. So uh, I would like to actually hear from the industry why in this case the free market isn't, isn't doing the job. Because, yes, we need to make sure that for the bottles that, are, that, uh, we, uh, that, that they are made from, you know, recycled material to ideally 100% uh, of it, of, of the material used. And I understand that the industry needs a, a quality and stable source of material, which the best is the old bottles. But uh, why uh, there is a need to legislate it? What is not working um, in the invisible hand of the free market here? Let's go straight to Mr. Neger then. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I, I think there's two very good reasons for that. The first one is the reality that with that, um, if that would be the case, you kill the idea of circularity. You can make a keyboard out of a bottle. You can never make a bottle out of a keyboard again. So why would you waste valuable resources and a product which today has the ability to be fully circular, to be downgraded to other materials? Right? I don't think that that is something uh, that could be promoted by the European Commission or any of my peers in the industry or, or myself. The second reason I would argue also is that we, as a bottled beverage industry, have a clear obligation um, laid out, spelled out in the SUPD, uh, where we're quite unique. So that is good. That's fine. Now, like, I'm, I'm very happy um, uh, to hear that we're moving towards mandatory deposit systems. Uh, hopefully, there's going to be some minimum requirements around that. Uh, but we can only achieve that or overachieve that and get to circularity if we get our own bottles back. So here, again, maybe just an illustration from, from Germany, because actually people need to realize that on a mandatory deposit system, indeed, um, that should be on all bottles, be it glass, refillable, non-refillable. Um, that, that is definitely what is the case in Germany. With the refillables, the bottles always stay in the ownership of the manufacturer uh, in this particular case. And they come back, and the mechanism between that is, uh, is the deposit system. On the non-refillables, when people bring them back to the return vending machines, they're being shredded and the trade can um, do with them uh, what they like. So that's, that's where you, in this case, you have a particular loophole and, and that's where we simply do not have the access to it. So it's for me, it's a clear reason on circularity. That's a clear sustainability reason. And then I would, uh, secondly, I would say the SUPD which obliges us to fulfill certain targets. So then you need to enable us to do it as well. And, and we are very happy to do so, as a matter of fact. OK, Martin Hosek, let me go back to you then straight away. Um, you asked for um, a response. You've got it. What do you think then? Well, uh, thank you. Interesting one. And I think that there is a one important uh, market concept that uh, we should use and that hopefully will also help. And I believe it will help uh, the... Uh, producers so to say get back uh, their bottles and that the in the deposit schemes uh, that I really hope that we have not only uh, mandatory across the union but also will have a certain interoperability between the different markets because honestly uh, you know Bratislava is just on the border with uh, Austria and Hungary and it's kind of we don't feel the borders anymore so hopefully this can be sorted out as well but uh, to get to the point is Extended producer responsibility, especially the individualized financial one, is where ultimately, because the companies that are putting uh, the bottles on the market are responsible for making sure that uh, they are collected, that they are uh, returned, ultimately through this uh, organization of uh, responsibility, 
you should have control. Would this would I hope that this could help to actually make this a reality, because when you have responsibility, you have a, a much higher degree of of control over the material. I would assume. Okay, so my degree to Lou then. Um, your thoughts on what you're hearing. Um, is there a sense that there's possibly a balancing act here of having an unfair advantage for the beverage industry versus, you know, having that real-time secularity? Um, let me, if I may, just first react to, to this previous discussion still. I just wanted to add, uh, and I, I agree uh, indeed with Martin, um, but I also agree with Rule, and not to not to be mistaken. I fully share your your views that um, it, it is important to ensure the the circularity. The DRS is is really a very important uh, tool in order to ensure the uh, to prevent littering, to increase the circularity of bottles. All this is fully shared, and and I support uh, you in this regards. But uh, I would also like to underline that under the revision of the packaging directive, there will be targets for recycled content content, not only for plastic bottles, as it is currently the case for the SUP under the SUP directive, which is where, which is one of the arguments why uh, also you came to us and, and, and asked for the consideration of this measure to, to uh, secure the access to the um, recycled content coming from the DRS. Um, but these other products uh, will not have a DRS because we cannot establish a de depositor return system for all kind of um, uh, products. I mean, this, this I think it's accepted also by the zero waste that there is a limited number of product categories for which you can um, meaningfully establish a deposit and return system. Uh, so in this way, somehow uh, other food uh, pro um, producers or let's say food packaging will be in a way disadvantaged compared to the bottles um, while having the same recycled content targets. Uh, so this situation is more complex than it currently seems. I mean, it will get more complex and we have to consider this legislation coming in uh, in the future and also not make sure that there, um, there is not a competitive disadvantage for producers of one sector over the uh, producers of the other sectors. Okay, Larissa Capello, um, let me get your thoughts then. Um, are you seeing the merits of, you could say, both arguments or both sides? Um, Yes, I also agree with both. <laughs> I think we're pretty much agreeing here in this debate. Um, so regarding DRS, um, I'm really happy to hear that it's in the in this in, considering the revision, and I hopefully as well that it will be the the essential criteria to make sure it's well it's well designed and function well uh, because it's pretty much a key uh, to make sure effectively collection uh, of uh, beverage bottles or hopefully other type of packaging as well, not only bottles uh, in the future, and also for refill and reuse. Um, and uh, regarding the recycle, the mandatory recycle content for other types of uh, packaging, um, I mean, we understand that, uh, of course, we would like to see all type of packaging materials included in the DRS, but we understand regarding the current situations uh, of some countries, it may not be possible to include it all at this point, but the recycled content, for instance, uh, requirements that uh, may come uh, in the revision of the new directive will um, kind of oblige as well or the other uh, producers of uh, materials to implement DRS as well. So I, I think it's quite positive and, and we hopefully, and you're going to see that DRS is actually the best way to collect uh, materials and have the purest fractions uh, of materials and ensure circularity. And Larissa, if, if, if I may, what are really the challenges of a deposit refund system? Because um, I think that's something that, you know, lots of people watching will will want to really know about. Yes, definitely. Um, so there's a lot of DRS, existing DRS schemes already uh, across Europe, um, but each of them functions differently. And of course, none of them are in their highest uh, efficient, let's say, efficiency. Um, so that's why we call, uh, uh, also with the industry, we called for setting up a criteria for um, the implementation of DRS, of new DRS schemes um, in Europe, 
um, to ensure it's well managed uh, with a central organization um, body that manages the DRS and ensure the design is cost efficient as well. Uh, the, the revenues stay in the systems and co cover the setup costs. Uh, and there are ma many, uh, many criteria as regarding the redemption points, as well as the participation of retailers as well in the process. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it's really important to have this criteria for setting up DRS to make sure it's efficient. Maya de Gridelou, would you like to jump in there? Well, I fully agree with uh, with this, and so we have also indeed included a measure which uh, which uh, um, which envisages setting up mandatory uh, minimum criteria for DRS, uh, not only for for those uh, categories um, for which we would uh, envisage setting the mandatory DRS, but also for any DRS that member states would envisage setting up. So this minimum criteria would apply uh, across all DRS. And we hope indeed that this is going to streamline and, and um, make the implementation of DRS um, easier. But we would not require the existing DRS to comply immediately. So there would be a long transition period and maybe even this requirement will apply only to the new DRS. We are still considering this. Okay, let me go back to Ms. Onega now. Um, the things that you're hearing, um, is this making you um, happier, you could say? Um, what, I, what I hear about um, mandatory deposit and, and indeed uh, the need for a, a central uh, deposit management, uh, that, that is absolutely uh, very much needed. So I'm, I'm, I think we're all on um, agree on that, and that's very important. I'd like to make two comments which are significant um, if we want to make this successful. And, and the first is uh, on Martin, who made a remark um, about deposited bottles and, and open borders. And there is a very clear consideration here. Um, and that, let me start by saying, by the way, that um, NMWE is, is, is not at all against refillable bottles or, or more uh, refillable bottles uh, in itself. We just need to be very fact-based and look at the virtues uh, of the advantages and disadvantages of the different types of, of packaging. But we're, we're not at all against that. But what cannot happen is that, that my refillable bottles end in the back of a camper van uh, in the south of Spain and the bottles could be given back there and I somehow need to retrieve my bottles from Spain. That doesn't sound economically and ecologically very sound to me. So a central deposit system needs to be on a national level um, for it to, to work and, and that's complex enough but we cannot start driving across Europe uh, retrieving bottles. That would be that would be very difficult. So that's that's the first consideration um, that I would want to want to give to him. Uh, the other thing um, is the question about uh, open markets and and circularity of other materials. Um, and I just want to make sure. I'm not sure I understood that. I, I, I hopefully misunderstood that. But to me, it sounds impossible that all sorts of categories uh, get a, a um, recycling target in their products, but there is only one source of recycled material being bottles. That is not going to work. So we are very um, committed as, as, a, as an industry to set up this circular system for which we need mandatory deposit, for which we need to get our bottles back to enable that. But if other categories have no obligation to collect their own materials and use them again for recycling purposes, then the, the math don't work. Martin Heisek, if you'd like to react. Uh, well, and the last I... point was rather to Maya. I'm not sure oh, I sorry, understood. Oh, sorry, it was to correctly. Maya, sorry, Maya. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry, the first sorry, one was to Martin, you. but the second one to Maya, yeah. Okay, so Martin Heisek first, Maya second, please. <laughs> Now on the on the uh, on the cross border for me I I see the point it's kind of uh, not feasible to do it uh, from one hand of the Euro uh, Union to the other uh, uh, but indeed we a we need to have some some standards and especially for uh, what I would say is the non refill uh, but when it goes to shredding and recycling uh, a higher level of of interoperability between the systems. 
So, uh, so to say, when you know, uh, I buy uh, some drinks uh, in Austria, uh, then uh, I should be able to find a way to return it in Breslava, which actually might be closer to the shop the, in Austria that I bought it than uh, most of the country itself. So this is since we have really higher inter uh, operability across the borders, uh, we have single market. This is something that. Uh, this one might be super easy to solve, but I think we need to look at it and make sure that this is uh, one of the loopholes that gets somehow plugged. Uh, and yes, uh, the the uh, the remark on the uh, you know different categories just just a very short note on that. Uh, I see the point. That's where obviously uh, you know you need back your materials. That's for me about the extended producer responsibility. That's that's the core of it. You are responsible for the entire life cycle. Hence, you should have the access to the waste. Okay, my degree is live. Yes. Uh, so yes, indeed, I can confirm that there will be a recycled content target, not only for CSP bottles. So yes, uh, there will be this situation and this will not apply only to PET. Um, as a material, but also to other plastics um, materials. I would also like to say that this is not going to happen tomorrow. These targets will be set for 2030. And we know that innovation in terms of recycling technologies, uh, in terms of sorting, uh, is really um, happening at the moment. There, there is a lot going on. And we do hope that all these technologies will also contribute to um, achieving the, the needed uh, purity um, in order to, uh, to, to use the recycled um, material also back into the food grade. Um, and uh, we do count on that. Um, but uh, I would also like to say that, um, yes, indeed, there, there will be, I mean, definitely there will be the shifting of the markets and prices and, and competition, then we can expect that we have already seen what has happened only with setting the targets for SUP. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do expect that such measures will provoke more research and development, more innovation, but also uh, certain competitive um, um, uh, pressures. Uh, that being said, I, I didn't say that uh, we are rejecting this measure altogether. We, I said that we have assessed it. So uh, let's let's stay with this uh, at the moment. Huh? But we have assessed the measure. <laughs> Okay, Ms. Onega, back to you. Then you've heard from both representatives of the institutions. Are they saying what you hope to hear? Yeah, well, I think I, I don't want to make it to, to too technical detail. So on, on Martin, I, I think he he indeed he, he acknowledged the, the complexity. It's it's going to be very similar on uh, non-refillable because then I need to admin, how do I administer that a bottle is being bought in Austria and being brought back to a machine and Bratislava, and then it, it's it's going to be very complicated. But anyway, um, I think that is typical, typically something where um, we appreciate the debate um, with the EU, so that we can, uh, like, because I think we can definitely come to a system uh, which will be very beneficial for you know, like the environment um, uh, in terms of becoming circular and preventing a litter. So we just we have a unique chance to do it now. There seems to be a lot of momentum. Let's just make sure that we that we get it right. Indeed. Um, and I'm quickly, um, Larissa, I do want to get you involved, but just quickly, there is a question from um, Raul Pop, so an audience member. And I think maybe this is a question for Maya. Um, and it's a good sort of, you know, practical question. He says, how can PET content be inspected across borders since we are talking about, you know, open borders then? You, it's a question about the traceability of recycled content. Yeah, how can the content be sort of inspected and, and you know, the quality of it really? Well, this is this is really very technical at the moment. I, I'm not sure I can answer it, but we will come up with a methodology. This is something that we will come up with, not in the legislation itself, but in the implementing act. Um, but uh, yeah, well, we, we believe there are ways and the first ways how to do that are being explored now under the SUP directive, the single use plastic directive, where uh, the commission is bound to come up with an implementing act on the calculation and reporting of recycled content in plastic beverage bottles. We have some delay there, but working is ongoing. So definitely there are, 
they have some ideas how to 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 trace and to report and to monitor and uh, we will definitely rely i mean hook on that work also as regards the same um, monitoring and reporting for recycled content yeah, for for other plastic products and uh, you know i mean packaging products <laughs> uh, that uh, we are going to propose in the future and so Larissa Capella then what do you make of um you know the question um, and what sort of minimum standards do you think should be in place then um as we have said, I, and also I think about about this about um, tracking the recycled content, etc. I think this uh, is really important to have the central deposit managed organization that will uh, be in charge and be responsible of monitoring uh, DRS not only for uh, the collection, separate collection for recycling, um, but also for refill and, and reuse applications to make sure it's, <laughs> as uh, Roa mentioned, it doesn't stay in Spain somewhere in a truck or, you know, that it's effectively collected and goes to the central place and goes to the washing, all the logistics. So that's why it's really important to have this criteria for DRS. And it's really important as well to involve retailers uh, we have heard that, for instance, in Netherlands, uh, retailers were a bit resistant to get involved on the deposit return schemes. For instance, um, they didn't want to place the, the RVMs, which the redemption point machines where uh, consumers give back um, the packaging in their, in their establishments. But it's really important. They are also part, they sell the products and they are also part, need to be part of the scheme as well. Okay, lovely. I'm going to start running through some of the questions because they are starting to come in. I guess um, everyone's had their coffee and they're waking up now, so that's brilliant to see. Um, so, good question from uh, Roy Brooks. He says, and this is for um, Roll. So he says, given the low recovery rate for PET, is the industry considering bioplastics as a replacement? And if not, what are the reasons behind that? So, Mr. Nega, if you'd like to take that question. Yeah, I wouldn't say we're we're considering a lot of things, but I I would make one key comments. Um, we have a solution today for circularity. Um, so in that sense, you even have to see if today it's possible. It's you know, like, is the material there? And is it even, let's say, competitive on a sustainable sustainability level to really getting to circular circularity um, in um, in our industry? Right. There is there is a lot which is being worked on. And obviously, we're we're following all of that uh, with a very keen eye. You know, like uh, there might be similar or you might put a similar question, for example, on um, technologies evolving on on chemical recycling. Uh, but they have some downsides as well. You know, like you need a lot of energy uh, to do that. So for that, again, to do that sustainably, sustainability, sustainability, sustainably well. Sorry about that. Um, you would need a lot of um, green energy um, and so on. So that's all. It's all possibilities you can look at. But I would first and foremost say we have a system, we have a packaging which, which has the capability of being fully circular today, technically, right? So it's just, it's simply about process. And with that, we mean uh, DRS and, and recollection. And then I think if we get to that, um, because there's, there's, when we implement that, there, there's very little standing in the way of full circularity. There is a reality that they're in the process. There will always be some loss of material so it's, you will never get to 100.0%, at least not today. That might improve in the future. And then you might look at that, what you feed in. You know, like, can that be bio-based, for instance? Or can that be based on chemical recycling? I think that, that would be good thinking to really move that. But the, the first really big moves that we can do today uh, in terms of the European Green Deal, in terms of sustainability, are really getting, you know, like collecting the bottles and using them again. And Larissa Capello, then, um, what do you make of, um, you know, bioplastics as a replacement? Um, we definitely don't support this replacement of bioplastics. I mean, it is still single use. Uh, again, we need to go and think upstream according to the waste hierarchy and according to the really, to the real meaning of circularity, which is reuse materials, retain the, the values the value in the loop um, and not just by replacing. So bioplastics 
it's uh, uh, the commission is also working i think on a on a framework to define uh the conditions where bioplastic would be applied or not and it has its um its use uh limited use and applications for instance a collection of waste um of bio waste etc but replacing bioplastics for for in bottles or other packaging materials and it doesn't it doesn't make sense it's still single use and we need to first think about prevention as i said there's a lot of a lot of uh for instance regarding water as i said it could be actually no packaging at all or even refill and reuse there's a lot of possibilities to um to have beverage uh reuse and refill um so think so by bio-based plastics it's it's really not uh, not a good substitution in this case, and actually, for it, it also needs separate, specific, separate collection that there is not in place. Uh, se separate collection for this for this type of material, so we just create a mess. So it's much better to go up and the waste hierarchy and prevention reuse. Okay, Martin, I'm going to come to you next. I know you also um, you, you have a few time constraints. Um, there's a question, though, here from Shelley uh, Bogra. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, should the role of product packaging size be standardized if harmonized system of recycling is to be developed? Well, um, good question. It's for me hard to answer, but I think the, the, it's, the standardization uh, and harmonization, it's more needed on the side of the materials rather than uh, uh, on the size of, uh, of the different packaging. Now, uh, and, this, uh, and on kind of also the recyclability of the materials and, and the mixes. Uh, there are a few examples of where, you know, actually the standard size wouldn't make a difference, but it's the, the materials that make a difference. And that's, for example, the use of the uh, soft PVC sleeves on top of the PET bottles, which are very damaging. And I then basically capable of destroying the whole batches because uh, it's a very different plastics that when you mix it up, it just uh, contaminates it. Uh, and because it's a PVC also uh, often contains not a very nice uh, additives, uh, softeners. So in this respect, it's about making sure that the material streams are uh, sufficiently compatible, uh, but also not necessarily very, very mixed up. And that's where I think we need to see uh, and look at the and talk with the industry how to streamline this, uh, so we don't add up with the with the mixtures that. Uh, are very high recycle, and I think this is this is still a, a big problem. And one little comment uh, on Lisa said regarding the um, the waste hierarchy and the bioplastics. I think these are two different issues ultimately, because of course we need to rigorously implement the waste hierarchy. And I, to be very frank, I think that uh, in many 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 cases in Europe, which is amazing continent, because most of us are lucky enough to have access to safe and drinkable tap water, uh, buying water in a bottle, however recyclable or refillable or whatever, it's still much less environmentally friendly. So in this respect, yes, pre uh, the prevention of uh, a waste creation is the best. And I'm not even talking about the associated transport cost. I think the CO2 emissions uh, associated with the, the transportation of a pipe, uh, water in the pipe to your kitchen, uh, is uh, nothing compared to uh, plastic uh, to to bottle uh, loaded on the truck, even from a very nearby uh, source. Not mentioning when you buy water from across the Europe, or to be very honest, Fiji water transported from Fiji. That's sorry, that's a complete nonsense from an environmental perspective. Uh, but also on the bioplastic, we'll need to find a way to, at the end of the day, replace the fossil feedstock because it's just embedded carbon. If you look at the fossil-based plastic that just embedded fossil carbon that one day, and maybe delayed by the fact that we recycle, it's going to go up in the atmosphere. And we cannot do this uh, if we want to have a climate that we can live with. Chris, I, I know that you wanted to jump in here and talk about standardization, something that I think you were saying that you would support that. Yes, um, so actually something I think more important than standardized packaging itself is to standardize 
the system. So I, I like to say there is no such a thing as sustainable packaging, but a sustainable system. Um, so that's why we strongly support, uh, for instance, manageable systems for reusable packaging. Um, where you have an institutionalized uh, governance structure uh, where you define the ownership of shared packaging, the cooperation, and how access and fair conditions of uh, each of the each of the stakeholders. Um, we define transparency and reporting. So, I mean, the systems where the packaging is in place, it's really important to have it um, setting a, a criteria for that even more than the packaging itself i would say but of course there's a lot a lot on the harmonization of packaging itself as well uh, but it's the system that that's going to make the whole thing work um and um i think that was my point on the harmonization <laughs> and mr nega then your sort of quick reaction on that then uh, well maybe I, I i i have to react on martin and larissa because they start hurting my feeling talking about tap water obviously <laughs> right um so it's it's a free world drink what you want right um but please do not start discriminating mineral water because actually when you look at mineral water this is a product which is naturally pure and i would argue it's it's arguably the healthiest beverage on the planet so and I don't think necessarily that, yes, at times you can drink tap water, but I don't think there will be full substitution necessarily from mineral water to tap water because people use it or drink it for very specific purposes. I like because they want the minerals, they like the particular taste, they like it because it's naturally pure. There are some other categories um, where that cannot necessarily be set without naming them. Um, and and uh, if you really want to talk about sustainability of beverages, then um you know why do we make this comparison can i can we make a comparison with the cup of coffee you had this morning and and see what that looks like um so i don't think there's a lot to be gained there at the end of the day we are an industry which has a relatively low co2 footprint that doesn't mean we want to improve we want to improve vastly for that there is two main challenges one we're talking about today which is circularity so packaging the other one still is transport now i think there's a lot of solutions there on the horizon um, um, that that will definitely not just for us because this is not specific to us, but in general, uh, that will make that a, that a lot better. But um, you know, I obviously would have to pledge here for the the for mineral water, and and besides, we're also preserving all these beautiful natural resources for generations to come. Right? Uh, we are a relatively young company in the mineral water business, um, having started in 1888. Right. Okay. So Martin Hosek, you've uh, hurt some feelings there. Would you like to respond? I also know that you do need to leave. So if you want to sort of sum up your sort of final thoughts um, on our discussion as well, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if I hurt uh, any feelings, but uh, for me, it's there is a spe and you have especially uh, highly mineralized waters, uh, which yeah, I agree they are actually having even medicinal purposes. But for me. Uh, the kind of the the issue is a lot of the use of uh, the very just just stable water, uh, but that's I think for a, for a separate uh, yet important discussion. We can uh, and I would be very keen to have it. Uh, but overall, I think what we need to look at is how do we try to stipulate in the European legislation a proper implementation of the base base hierarchy. So have uh, a strong motivation uh, coupled with I would say internalizing external costs or not necessarily fee based but internalizing external costs into the final product price into the refill system and they should have a priority over uh, recycling of the materials we need to have a high standards across the union and ideally from my point of view uh, mandatory in the member states uh, bottle deposit schemes I think this is, and also can deposit scheme it kind of works for them as well. I think this is something which is proven the best way forward. And using the extended producer responsibility uh, that is financially individualized, because I think that creates a more better feedback loop for the individual companies when they put the product market uh, products on the market to alter the design in a more environmental way, to ensure that uh, the uh, producers actually have excess or a higher degree of control uh, over their own ways and therefore have a, the chance to get the materials back
for the recycling to make sure that you know we can properly close the loop. Okay, lovely. Well, Martin Isaac, um, MEP, it's been a pleasure to have you on this discussion. Um, we'll let you go now, but thank you so much. Okay, well, I will now continue with some of the questions from our audience. Um, there's quite a few to get through. Um, so we have one for My Degree de Lou, and we actually have quite a few for you, so you might uh, get quite a few questions coming your way. Um, they say, so it's Trudy Bernier, and she says that the um, from her perspective, reuse and recycling is addressing the issue downstream, which matters, but not addressing fossil feedstocks means ignoring the upstream part of the question. To reach circularity, the two need to go hand in hand. Yeah, point taken. But I mean, this revision is already so complex. We are dealing with so many issues. Uh, to now start entering the issue of, you know, uh, ensuring a carbon, um, uh, I don't know, if, yeah, that, that from the carbon perspective, the, the input into the, the packaging market is also uh, as low as possible in terms of carbon borne emissions, it's, it's going to get really complicated to get that kind of comparability of, of materials from the, um, um, you know, um, f from that point of view, carbon emissions point of view. So we have so far um, not done that. I mean, it would be really um, opening another Pandora's box if we wanted to, to, to enter into this discussion. So, so far we avoided it. Okay, lovely. Um, another question then from Ella. Um, she says, um, the return to plastics to implement DRS in all EU member states. So basically a question is, why is it so difficult now to get your own non-refillable bottles back with a DRS for a company? What is the loophole? And what solution would you propose to solve this? Um, I think, Mr. Aneka, you can maybe take that one. Yeah, <clears throat> well, you just need to make sure that um, that you can buy back, yeah, like your the your fair share, let's say, of the material. Uh, that is not happening at the moment because, again, you know, like, and in that sense, there there is you know, like that's a difference with refillables because they come back to the factory, they stay our ownership. On non-refillables, when you bring them back to the return vending machine. They are basically being compressed and they go into big bags and the, the retail trade sells them to the recycling industry. And then what happens is if that is open to any industry, uh, then obviously it's very difficult to get back your fair share because a lot of it, because it's no longer circular. Again, if part of this goes to keyboards and car and textile and so on, you can never make a bottle out of it again. So there is a drain in terms of the material on our hand, which is not the case when, you, when you're working in the other industries, because a, a, a PET bottle is obviously perfectly suitable uh, to make your textiles. I mean, they love it, actually, because it's so clean and it's so clear um, and so on. But again, you need to set, make sure that the keyboards and the textile don't end up in incinerators um, and uh, landfill and what have you, because otherwise you can never get there. So that's why you need to make sure, in particular, on this very high quality quality and very circular material, material of food grade um, PET bottles, that we can use them again. Exactly. Um, and possibly, um, Larissa, would you like to um, comment on that question um, and, and, and also uh, what Raul also said there? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I'd like to, yes, to make a point on the on the other questions about uh, the CO two emissions and, and packaging. Actually, um, it's there was a study that estimates that the CO two emissions from materials used for packaging are more than uh, the, 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 than from those of the global aviation. So, I mean, there's a lot of CO2 emissions that can be prevented by uh, going towards uh, reuse and refill of packaging already. Um, so uh, we have already many studies as well uh, that shows that, for instance, uh, if, we, if we switch to reusable packaging from the, from the Oreca sector, um, that can be already savings from 3.7 million tons of CO2 equivalents. So uh, the discussion about the feedstock, I mean, as I mentioned before, biobase, et cetera, is it still single use? Let, let's, let's move up the discussion upstream and think what we can do on prevention and reuse because there's a lot of we can, do, we can, we can do that there. 
Thanks. And Maya, you wanted to also um, react here. Yes, I would just wanted to say that indeed I fully agree with uh, Larissa and I didn't want to say that we are not dealing with CO2 emissions of packaging. Of course, we are dealing with CO2 emissions of packaging. This is one of our main objectives. This is an initiative under the Green Deal. And as you know, the Green Deal, uh, one of, uh, I mean, the main objective of Green Deal is crime and climate neutrality by 2050. So we are fully inscribed in that uh, process and in, this, uh, in these objectives. Um, but what I wanted to say is indeed that bio-based you know, making it mandatory in packaging and so this is not something that what we are considering right now because we do believe that there are other ways to to reduce the, the co2 impact of packaging in particular what larissa said but also through recycled content obligations uh, because recycled content is the best feedstock that we have for packaging and that is also demonstrated by many studies Okay, and Maya, we also have a question from Arthur Tinwald for you. Um, he says, does the proposal address simulating the switch from bottle to tap water as to prevent a major part of PET use in the first place? Uh, if we simulate the switch to tap water, well, I don't think we are talking about the same products here. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Anega can probably confirm uh, that as well. Uh, there is possible certain level of switch, and and indeed we are going to promote. Uh, um, there is there are going to be specific targets proposed for reuse also on uh, on the on the mineral water <laughs> uh, in general. So there will be definitely a push for for more. Um, reuse, refill solutions, but whether tap water is exactly the same as mineral water, I wouldn't like to enter into this discussion. I'm not an expert for that. Okay, and I think mentioning tap water uh, makes Mr. Nega feel um, sad. <laughs> so we leave another discussion. Um, okay, we also have a question quickly from Mary Ryden. Um, she says, uh, reuse bottles eventually enter the waste stream and then they also need to be made circular. Um, Larissa, perhaps you could comment on that one. Yes, definitely. Totally agree. I mean, all reusable uh, bottles or packaging will one day become uh, at the end of the life cycle and they definitely need to be circular. I mean, circular means to be recyclable uh, at the end of the life as well and keeping the materials. That, that's what circularity is, keeping the materials values reuse them as much as possible until until their very end and going back to the loop so yeah totally agree on that okay and then i think we'll take one last question um maya again it's for you um roy brooks says if it's too complex to consider non-fossil feedstock in the current legislation Given the growing economic pressures on fossil fuels, the challenges of creating a fully functional recycling system, when will it be time to consider it? It's a good question, but there is definitely a communication also coming up on the bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics. I'm sure that uh, this issue will be addressed there as well. Um, and uh, maybe this is the right place, uh, whether it, it has to be in the legislation or not, would also be part of this discussion. Okay, lovely, thanks for that. Okay, well, listen, look, we're sort of reaching the end of this debate now. Um, and um, so I would like to ask you all for sort of your final statements, your final comments. Uh, Maya, if you'd like to go first. Oh, well, thank you very much, first of all, for organizing this debate, which um, uh, I didn't quite expect turned into a debate a lot about bio-based uh, feedstock, which is interesting and which I, I will take note of and also report to my colleagues. Um, but as a general note, I would like to say that we are fully supportive uh, and fully aligned also with um, with, uh, with the coalition, uh, which formed in order to to also promote the, the, um, the, the, the mandatory DRS and minimum requirements requirements and we have so far really listened to the different stakeholders in these regards and have uh, adapted also our impact assessment. Uh
uh, for that purpose. Um, but I'm sure that the discussion uh, is still ongoing and will still also be ongoing afterwards, even once the proposal of the Commission comes out and goes back, uh, I mean, goes to the to court legislators. And we have heard Mr. Um, uh, Martin that there are already some very clear views also in the Parliament as uh, on, on this issue. So I'm, I'm sure uh, there would be also amendments and changes to the hour to our proposals, which we try to take into account already now to the extent possible, of course. But at some point of time, we also need to close the debate and make the proposal. Thank you, lovely. And Larissa Capello, if you'd like to go next. So yeah, thank you again uh, for the debate, a really interesting discussions, and I'm really happy to hear about the, what is coming uh, from the from the Commission proposal, the PPWD, um, and yeah, I'm, again, I'm going to stress uh, the need to really focus on prevention reuse here when you talk about circularity, because still a lot of People think first about recycling when you call circularity. The true circularity is prevention and reuse. Um, for all the reasons I have mentioned in this debate. Um, so we really need this driving motor and this ambitious legislation to kickstart this transition. And the beverage sector um, is really one of them that already is already step forward on this transition to reuse and, and can, can even go beyond. Uh, so really expect to have this uh, reuse targets, uh, sector specific reuse targets, um, as well as this DRS criteria, which is the basis uh, for this to function well. Um, and yeah, um, I'm really looking forward for this, to, for this proposal um, and for having more circular packaging in the EU. Thank you. Okay, and then just lastly, roll in that again. Yeah, so thanks again for um, for today's event. I think uh, overall, I find it very encouraging. I think there is a lot of momentum um, around the discussion now. Um, so let, let's keep let's keep going and let's keep uh, let's keep let's keep the pressure on that because I think we are by definition an industry where we can make a change relatively easy and fast. Now, like I think even NMWE believes that if we would be very ambitious, we could get to 90% recollection in 2025. But then things need to change um, today, so to speak. Um, but again, our products are fully circular uh, today, have the capability of being fully circular today. And I think we need to leverage that. And yes, Larissa, we are definitely open to reuse and, and, and recycle, but let's continue to look at the facts. And maybe one other point on that as well, which is that obviously, setting up a reuse system in a country where it does, doesn't exist today is very complex because a um, the supply chain and the production line of refillables is vastly different uh, than that of non-refillables right so that also takes a lot of time to actually set that up um, but again we i think we're open to uh, very much to both again i find it very encouraging i i uh, it's good that there is a dialogue between the industry and the eu commission and and the NGOs, and let's continue that uh, to to make a real change for the better. Well, I definitely think it has been um, a very lively discussion. So thank you to all of you. And also thank you to Martin Hosek, MEP, who had to leave just a little bit earlier. Um, and to all everyone who has, of course, been watching online, thank you for all of the questions that you've submitted. I hope you've gotten the answers um, that you were looking for. And also that this debate has also given you, you know, a good flavour of what the circularity of bottles is all about. Um, I'm Rome Zaidi and you've been watching a Euractive debate supported by Natural Mineral Waters Europe. Take care and bye-bye.